Here we're going to go through reaction energy diagrams. I want to look at how I used to teach them versus how I like to teach them now, what the difference is and why it works better now that I've kind of made some changes. So when I first started teaching, we would do a really simple presentation for reaction energy diagrams where we would just have one like this, one like this, and we would talk about that the reactants have a certain amount of chemical energy, they react, something happens, something changes, and then the products have a new amount. If that new amount is less than what we started with, that energy has to go somewhere, so therefore it exits the chemical system. Here, same thing, but, but different result. We start with a certain amount of energy, chemicals react and they change, and we end up with a new amount. If it's higher, that means that energy had to have been input from somewhere, and therefore energy went into the system, it is endothermic. So we would talk about exo mimicking exit, and endo mimicking into, and then therm, of course, meaning energy or heat. But when we did that, we really weren't challenging any student ideas or conceptions of how anything works in reality. There was no particulate model, uh, there was no real actual chemical reactions going on, and one of the ideas that students don't really get that they really need to process is how energy changes as particles move closer or further. You can imagine why it's really easy for a student to think that as particles move closer together they would be higher in energy, okay? which is backwards from here. Here we see that as they move further apart the energy goes up. Well the reason why a student will think that as they move closer together that the energy is going up is because they're used to seeing things with magnets. And for magnets the closer they get the stronger the force of interaction. Force is not the same thing as energy, and so it's actually increasing uh, in force while it's decreasing in energy as they move closer together, but that is a very non-intuitive path for a student to take. So it's a little simpler if you go, you know, which one has more energy, the pen here or the pen here? Well, as we've increased that separation with the Earth, there's more energy between the two in that system. Well, that's not an idea that kids are gonna think through on their own. So here's a way we do it that, that works in my head a little bit easier for most students to kind of grasp and understand. We don't use any energy, and if you think about it, really energy of what? What, what intuitive idea are you latching onto there that's already in a student's brain? So instead we look at an actual reaction. This is the simplest one I've found to do. And in it, we're looking at how the particles are moving. So we have A and B reacting with C. If the reaction occurs, B is going to stick to C, and it's going to break the bonding interaction between A and B. Now let's assume these two things collide. Let's say they kind of hit, and they hit really slowly, so they're not going to react. When they collide, the A and B are going to kind of vibrate, and what needs to be able to happen is that the force of interaction between A and B, the bonding interaction, needs to be strong enough that C can accelerate back to A. So, if, I'm sorry, B can accelerate back to A. So if B's kind of moving away and A's moving away, we need enough force to be able to turn those around and change those velocities to bring them back. At some point, the velocity between A and B is so large that there's not enough bonding force to bring them back together and they permanently separate, or semi-permanently separate. So let's take a look at that happening. So down here we have this kind of transition state, which we would represent as up here on, on one of these. So, so here we have B broken apart from A, um, potentially moving towards C. So we want to look at two things. The first thing we want to look at is what's going on with the forces. So for forces, we're going to draw and pick whether it's Wednesday or not. And the force of attraction between A and B, A and B are attracting each other like this. And they're, they're pulling on each other. And then we think, all right, well, if these are gonna break that bond, they have to move apart from each other. So then we look, okay, well, what's going on with the direction of motion? So let's do that in black, motion. So in order for the bond to break, B has to move this way, and A has to move this way. They have to move apart from each other. Now, if we look at B in particular here, if B is moving this way and it's being pulled that way, what's going to happen to its speed? Well, if I'm moving this way and being pulled that way, then my speed is going to slow down. That's the way that situation works. So as A and B separate, A and B slow down because their motion counteracts their forces. Now let's look at the opposite side of that. So now we have B and C forming a bond. So we have a force of attraction between them. And then for motion, in order to form a bond, we need this to move towards this. 
So forming a bond is different than breaking a bond. In breaking a bond, your force and your motion oppose each other. Here, our motion and our force are aligned. So if I'm moving this way and I'm being pulled this way, what's going to happen to my speed? It's going to increase right? because of that alignment. So as B and C move towards each other, they get faster and faster and faster. Okay. So when we look on these curves, we can see that. So as I'm moving from here and I'm breaking that bond, I'm slowing down. That's very intuitive. It's going uphill. We understand that we're going to slow down. But here we can connect why we're slowing down. Okay. Then once we reach a certain point, the particles start to move closer together. And at that point, now we're looking at a case where our forces and motion are aligned, and therefore we're speeding up. And it's very intuitive for, for students to see that. So now if we put together an actual reaction. We'll take a little baking soda and vinegar, and we mix them. I hope I don't overflow here. So as I do this, it feels cool to me. And what that means is, is that means that the particles are slowing down more than they speed up. Okay, therefore, when I come in, I now have these particles moving at slower speeds, so then I input energy into this. So this is an endothermic process in order for this to happen. Okay. Whereas, there are other reactions that we can do, such as burning stuff. When we do this, these start at a certain temperature, and then as they react, we are having particles now move faster. So in that case, we had particles break apart bonds and slow down, but then they sped up as they formed new bonds more than they had slowed down. You can kind of see this in this picture. Here we have a strong bond being broken and a weak bond forming. So in that case, what's going to happen is these particles are going to slow down a lot as they break apart. We really had to put a lot of energy in to break them apart. But when we form the new bond, they're going to speed up some, but they're not going to speed up as much as they had slowed down. Therefore, according to how we've drawn this, this would be an endothermic process. Now, when you do things like this, you're doing, a, you're doing things at a cognitive load level that students without physics can handle. There's nothing complicated over here. There's if I'm pulled this way and moving this way, I'm going to speed up. If I'm pulled that way and moving this way, I'm going to slow down. Those are very approachable things for high school students to be able to do, regardless of whether they've even had physics. Whereas over here, when we're talking energy, we're at a level beyond where our students can comprehend, and therefore they're going to miss a lot. They're going to fill in those gaps with, with whatever they can, which is not going to go well. And so that's why I think this is a far better way to teach this than what I used to do. In addition to that, a lot of teachers will present that they find that students get very confused because in biology class, they're told the opposite. They're told that breaking bonds uh, breaking bonds um, uses energy or releases energy and that, and that forming bonds requires energy because of how uh, something they do in photosynthesis and the ATP leading to bond formation and, and breaking that, that doesn't really jive with things because they're only looking at one of the bonds and not all of the bonds. This avoids all of that. So when a student has had biology and they've learned this incorrect idea, they've usually just learned it as vocabulary phrasing they don't actually have a concept to build it upon. This gives them that concept. So then when we go back, they have to go, oh, okay, well, something's wrong here. There must be something else going on. And it is, it's that there's hydrolysis reactions happening. In addition to just like an ATP breaking a phosphate off, there's some water molecules coming in in order to do that. And that's where some of that other energy that's not being analyzed comes into play. So this is something I found that works a lot better. Uh, it works better for high school level, but also just in general. I think anytime you can avoid using energy and replace with force and motion, you'll get a much better understanding. And that's really what we're looking for.